Good afternoon. I am uh, so honored to be here. Um, and I love me some Pearls and some Kiva and some Leanne Pittsford, right? Yeah. So in 1977, years before most of you were born, the woman on the right, Donna Hitchens, founded what was then the Lesbian Rights Project. She was fresh out of law school from UC Berkeley, and she was looking around at the state of the legal rights for particularly lesbians, but for all LGBT people, and she realized that issues mostly faced by lesbians, employment, custody, visitation, family issues, were not being addressed by any other organization. So that has become an animating feature of what is now the National Center for Lesbian Rights. The question we ask all the time, and Roberta Actenberg, standing next to her, was our second executive director, and the animating question is, who is being left behind? And we ask that question every year, we ask it every day, and it has led us to do work across the entire spectrum of our community. I became executive director of NCLR after being legal director for a couple of years in 1996. So, holy shit, it's 21 years that I've been the executive director of NCLR, which I can't believe. And if you knew anything about my attention span, you would realize how, what a miracle that is. When I came to NCLR in the 1990s, this is now almost 20 years past its founding, the issues were still the same. Lesbians losing custody of their kids or visitation, gay men losing visitation with their kids, transgender people being kicked out of their communities, people losing a sense of self, any sort of security, no place for them in their families. There was a handful, a handful of elected LGBT officials. Certainly no one with any big platform or celebrity was openly lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. It was one year past my, um, my selection as executive director. You have to ignore the hair. Uh, the biggest controversy that I faced in that first year after um, assuming leadership of NCLR was when Ellen DeGeneres came out on her sitcom. Many of you may not know that before Ellen had this wildly popular talk show, she had a sitcom called Just Us Friends, and it was on ABC in prime time. It was one of the most popular shows in that time. Ellen came out on Oprah's show in 1996, and then in 1997, she made the decision to have her character come out on her sitcom. People fucking lost their minds. <laughs> I ended up booked on what was then the biggest cable show of the time, Crossfire, facing the biggest homophobe of the time, the Reverend Jerry Falwell. Yeah, total douche. So, as Falwell was talking about what an abomination LGBT people were, homosexuality was, he then made this comment. This is all about the gay agenda. And the American people do not want to see this lesbian lifestyle paraded in their living rooms. Let me just say that I appreciate an opportunity to respond to the rhetoric that Reverend Falwell and others oppose to lesbian and gay civil rights parrot, and that is that there is some sort of gay agenda. Let me just say, as a lesbian and the executive director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, I can assure you there is not a gay agenda. What lesbians and gay men seek is the same kind of access, safety, and security that every other American enjoys and to not be vilified, to not be punished, to not suffer based on our sexual orientation. It's an agenda of human rights. It's not some specialized agenda. Let me, let me ask the Reverend know, Paul out. Do, and do I don't you... know, uh, Geraldine, I don't know of anyone who is a reasonable person who doesn't agree with Kate on that last statement. Okay, what the F? Jerry Falwell agrees with me on that last statement. I just want to point out, nine years later, he dropped dead of a heart attack. You're welcome. <laughs> now, the founding of NCLR and what Donna and Roberta did, and my 
leading this organization is the quintessential personal is political. As I said in the statement, as a lesbian and the executive director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, you know, putting these two things together. The lesbian is the personal thing, the executive director position is the political thing. And that's how we think about it, that, oh, the activists do that thing, and then I live my life. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, those days, if they ever existed, are over. The political is personal, and the personal is political. There is no more sitting on the sidelines. There is no more bystanding. This is a moment where you're all activists. You're all part of an army of resistance. And you may not be Muslim. You may not be an African-American man targeted by police in your community. You may not be transgender. You may not be an undocumented immigrant. But we all are all of those. And in order for those communities to be protected, we need to step up. Justice will not be served. Justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. And I'm fucking outraged. I don't know about you. But I'm outraged. And that is how you serve justice, by being outraged. I know, look, it's tiresome and it's difficult and it's, oh my God, it's exhausting. But that is how we serve justice. And you know, it hasn't required a whole lot of exhortation. It's 34 days since the inauguration of a madman. 34 days. And yet, the day after, his inauguration. I want you to, if you, if you participated in any one of the marches in this country or around the world, I want you to stomp your feet. Let's, let's make the house right. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. That day was the day that I knew he's going to do terrible things. He's already done terrible things this week, a prime example, but he is not going to be able to do his worst. We are not going to allow him to do his worst. And those marches, look, I've seen a lot in my years of doing this work. I've never seen anything like what I saw in Washington, D.C. that day. That's how we're going to fight back. And it's not just the marches. You know, you can't, because it can't just be, you know, one-off protests. What also happened is in the wake of the announcement of the Muslim ban, lawyers showing up at airports, protesters showing up to say, not on our watch. We will not allow it. Lawyers who didn't know anything about immigration, didn't know anything about sanctuary or asylum, showing up to say, whoever you're detaining, I'm their lawyer. That's, that's showing up. That's how we make a difference. And sometimes, making a difference and showing up is simply by speaking your truth. The president is not a huge fan of me. <laughs> but that is so okay. And Donald, if you didn't like me then, you're really probably not gonna like me now because I'm hosting SNL and I'm like so gay, dude. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I, for one, am super happy to welcome Kristen Stewart to the family. And sometimes, that's just what it is. Just speaking your truth, being authentic. It always helps as you step into that being authentic and that power and melding this personal, this political, to have a champion. I was lucky enough to have my earliest champion be my mother. My, uh, my mother supported me unquestionably. She uh, was the most important person in my life. I choose this picture because it's so weird that my sister and I decided it was yellow day. And, um, and that's my mom sort of peeking there. And my mom was the sort of person who lit up every room she ever walked into. She was always smiling. I literally, truly, honestly never heard her say a bad word about anyone. She could always find the good. And I love this picture because it also shows my mother before she had her stroke. In 1993, my mother had a, a debilitating, devastating stroke. She was 56, the exact age I am right now. She lost pretty much everything in her life. She could never work again, she could never drive again, she could never take care of her finances again. She was able to still live independently in her house, which we're in right there, but her life changed dramatically. 
and the mom I had was a much more feebled person. Ten years later, she had another stroke in 2003. My sister calls me, that's my sister Sharon there. You can tell who the dyke is just by looking at the backs of this. <laughs> so funny. So my sister calls me and says, mom's had another stroke, you have to get home right away. And so I was on the first plane back home, made it, um, and watched my mother begin this long slog back from yet another stroke. She had a lot of speech aphasia, which people who know, people who've had strokes, know about. So I'm there probably a month after the stroke, and the speech therapist comes to take her for speech therapy. And the speech therapist is asking her what would normally be very simple questions. Where are you from? What are the jobs you've had? Tell me about your kids. Where do your kids live? What do your children do for a living? And through all of these questions, pulling the language out is just such a struggle. And then the speech therapist turns to me and she says, well, um, Kathy's here, my family calls me Kathy. Kathy's here from San Francisco. Why don't you tell me what Kathy does for a living? And I'm thinking, well, this should be fascinating. <laughs> and my mother looks at the speech therapist, and then she looks at me and keeps her eyes right on me while she says, well, what Kathy does is very important. She takes care of all the lesbians and gays in the world. <laughs> I know, right? And the speech therapist turns to me and says, well, that's an awfully big job. <laughs> and look, that's the mom I got. So the launch that I got was just enormous. So find that champion for you. Whoever that is, if it's your parent, you're super lucky. But if it's not, there's someone, and you deserve a champion. 45 seconds, I'm almost done. Power without love is reckless and abusive. The favorite first sentence of my favorite Martin Luther King quote, power without love is reckless and abusive, and we've seen 34 days of that. Love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and love at its best is power, correcting everything that stands against love. For the last decade, we as a queer community have benefited immeasurably from this marrying, no pun intended, of power and love, and now we pay it forward. And look, I know it's not gonna be easy, but like as Toni Morrison wrote, there is no time for despair. There is no place for self-pity. There is no need for silence, and there is no room for fear. We just don't have the space for that. And yet, I do know that there will be moments, I've felt them, where we will feel fear, we will feel despair. So this is what you do. You throw back a couple of shots of Patron, you hang out with your friends, you go to the museum, you hit the gym, you fuck your girlfriend, and you wake up the next morning, and you suit up again, you put your game face on because we need you on the field. We got this. You were born for this moment. Thank you.